Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Head of the Charles weekend. We thought it would be great to kick off the weekend by having a special forum here at the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're glad to have so many people here, especially with the weather being so nice outside. Um, today's forum is going to be in the form of an interview. Uh, Lois Romano, who is with Politico and was an IOP fellow and for many years was a reporter and columnist for the Washington Post, is going to interview Mayor Emanuel. And we're really excited to have the mayor back. He was a participant in our 2002 Members of Congress uh, seminar, he, where he learned how to be a great congressman and eventually got into leadership. And now, as you all know, he's the mayor of Chicago. But first, please join me in welcoming Lois Romano back to the forum and to the Harvard Kennedy School. Lois. Thank you all. I am just delighted to be here and be back here. And I'm, I'm particularly delighted to um, have a conversation with my old friend, Rahm Emanuel, uh, the esteemed mayor of Chicago now. Um, I was a, a fellow here in 2008, and Rahm was kind enough to come up here and speak to my study group. And it was so popular that we kept that Today we had to keep moving rooms, like we started in the small room, then we kept moving and moving. We never got to the forum. Um, and he was excellent um, and insightful, um, and everybody loved it. Um, but when he left, people were a little bit disappointed because he didn't use some of the colorful language that he's known for. <laughs> and we didn't see the Rambo style. And actually, it's true. People came up to me later and said, yeah, he was great, but he was really serious. Um, now President Obama, then Senator, used to love to tell the story about how um, the mayor uh, was working in a deli when he was in high school and um, lost part of his finger in a uh, slicing machine. And what, the, what Mr. Obama said was it rendered him virtually mute. <laughs> middle finger. So. <laughs> Um, uh, Rahm's had a very interesting journey uh, to politics, and it wasn't conventional. As um, Some of this, I'm sure some of you know, he was a ballet dancer in his younger years in high school, and he won a, he was offered a scholarship to the Joffrey, but turned it down to go to college. Um, shortly after college, he went to Washington, and he uh, worked for various Congress people. And then in 92, he got his big break, and he was the finance director for Bill Clinton's first campaign. And he raised a ton of money, which proved to be invaluable to Bill Clinton um, when he became very embattled during that primary season. He went on to work in the White House. Um, two stints, is that correct? And then you went in and then left the White House and then went back to the White House? Did you do two stints, right? Uh, first, uh, first term and the second term continuing. And then continuing, back, okay. Yeah. Um, then he left. I'm sure and, there were some people that would like to have seen it that, that way. <laughs> then he left to go make some money so he could go back into politics, um, ran for Congress in 2002, and served three terms. Part of that time, he was um, the chairman of the DCCC and is really widely credited with, with ending the Republican Revolution and bringing um, the Democrats back into power. He... Uh, one of the hallmarks of that election was he recruited a whole new breed of moderates in the middle of the country, young, fresh faces who had never run before. Um, and then he terrified them. And more than one of those young members told me how they would be going to a campaign event and just kind of driving along, minding their own business, and the cell phone would ring. And on the other end was a voice, didn't identify itself, and just said, you're not gonna F this up, are you? And they didn't. Um, they won the election, and Rom helped put the first female speaker in the, uh, in the House, which was really great. Um, in 2008, after Mr. Obama was elected, he asked Rom to be his chief of staff. And I know that was a very hard decision for him because he liked his job. But he stepped down to do that um, and then had an opportunity three years later to uh, leave the White House and to run for mayor. And he ran and won handily. So with that, please welcome the mayor of Chicago. Thank you, Lois. I will say, uh, if I can, um, when I used to do the Sunday shows, uh, my mother-in-law would always say after the show, she would call and say, oh, you did so well. Now you gotta understand, my 
in-laws are from Chagrin Falls, uh, Ohio, which I call Back to the Future. Second, they're Republican. And I used to say to Mary, I, you didn't really think I did well. You were just happy for 18 minutes you held your breath that I didn't say the F-bomb on national TV. <laughs> and because you don't agree with a single thing I just said. Uh, so here's what I would like to talk about, and then we'll obviously take the questions wherever they go, or as Henry Kissinger used to say, does anybody have any questions for my answers? And then we can kind of go for, uh, <laughs> from there. He is a product of Harvard afterwards, so just thought I'd say that. Uh, here's, um, first of all, I'd like to yell, though, I have been fortunate, as Lois just uh, did a short summary of my uh, career, is working for President Clinton, being in Congress, and working for President Obama. Single greatest job I ever had, being mayor of the city of Chicago. Best job, and I've been very fortunate. Uh, that must be the five people from the Chicago area that now have moved out and are happy. Uh, <laughs> But here's, and what I mean by that is, this is a job, and just give you by one analogy and then work through it. Yesterday, I opened up our new runway at O'Hare. And in the summer, May, I had made a decision in the spring, we were gonna shut down the entire red line south, rebuild all 11 miles of track, or 10.9 miles, and all new stations, finally giving the people, the residents of the uh, south side, 20 minute reduction on their train ride from home to work, and all new stations that have been existed in other parts of the city. Nowhere else, being Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, Senior Advisor to the President, can you move the needle so much for a community? And while there are lows, there are great highs, and you can actually get stuff done, which gives me what I really want to talk about today. There are 150 cities around the world that drive the economic, intellectual, and cultural energy of the world economy, or 100, whatever the number you want to pick, but they drive it. Now, we just witnessed two weeks of some high-end dysfunction. That's not limited, though, to the United States. The nation state that we knew in the past is broken across the world, not just in the United States. Cities are where things not only happen, but are getting done. And not just because we're where the rubber meets the road and you know, there's no partisanship in picking up garbage. That's somewhat true. But it's more than that. And that is where actually all the energy of the world economy is, where the intellectual power is, to be honest. I always say, like in the city of Chicago, while we're home to a tremendous amount of Fortune 100 companies, our biggest economic engines are our universities. Our University of Chicago, our Northwestern, our Loyola, our DePaul's. Those four-year institutions plus our community colleges drive our ec economy. Now, the good news for the city of Chicago is The Economist magazine did a survey of 150 cities last year worldwide. And of that, they said the city of Chicago is the only city in all of North America, not the United States, all of North America, to move into the top 10 rankings for worldwide economic competitiveness, and only two in the entire United States, New York and the city of Chicago. And they focused on three things. One, the skill and education uh, capacity of our workforce. 35% of the people in the city of Chicago have a four-year college degree or better. Nationwide in the United States, that's 27%. My job, grow that delta, never let it shrink. It's a huge economic strategic advantage. I'll come back through each of these and we'll try to do what I can't do in Q&A. Two, we have an incredible modern transportation system, moving goods and services more efficiently than anybody else. I'll give you by way of example, I just told you what we did at O'Hare, just told you what we did on the Red Line South. At O'Hare, it was just rated as the most connected airport in all of North America. You can get anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country, the United States or North America, directly, every day, weather permitting. And that's, not, that's something I'm working on right now. <laughs> it is the most connected airport you have. And in a global economy, you can't get there without it. And the reason 21 companies have now moved their headquarters, including GE Transportation Worldwide, Google Motorola Worldwide, have moved their headquarters to the city of Chicago, we have an incredibly skilled, educated workforce, and a very modern transportation system, including in our mass transit system, I can include that. More people take the CTA, the public transportation of the city of Chicago, in a single month than take all of Amtrak nationwide all year to give you a scope of the scale. Now on the airport, with the runway expansion, it's the, I am literally taking the capacity that exists at Midway Airport and moving it to O'Hare. That's how big the expansion is, the largest expansion of any airport in America right now, under construction, adding the new run capa runway capacity. We are building, uh, adding 37 miles, or build, taking out 37 miles of slow zones in our 
mass transit system, every station will be either refurbished, rebuilt, or re, uh, redone in some capacity. All the buses in the system, all the trains in the system, totally replaced. Now, everything I'm talking about, paid for. So I'm not talking about what I'd like to do. I'm talking about what we're doing right now. Also on our infrastructure, we have 900 miles of water pipe that's 100 years or older. It's all being replaced in the decade. 670 miles of sewer, 160,000 catch basins, two of the largest water filtration plants, all being rebuilt top to bottom. And my favorite part of our infrastructure, besides what we're doing on our school modernization, our community colleges, is we are rebuilding every playground in the city of Chicago, all 300 standalone playgrounds, adding 167 acres of park plan, the equivalent of five new millennium parks throughout the city of Chicago. In five years' time in the city of Chicago, every child, regardless of where they live, regardless of what their income, regardless of what their race is, will live within a 10-minute walk of a new park in the city of Chicago. And no city can make that commitment to their children like the city of Chicago. In addition to that, The Economist magazine noted for the city of Chicago that the public sector, we actually do what we say we're going to do. As you can probably see, that's in my DNA. And I actually believe in that. Because I think the most important thing you can do as a city is give from the public sector is give people confidence and certainty around what you're going to do. Now, the other thing is I'm introducing my budget next week, Wednesday. It will be the third week in a row, a third year in a row, rather, that I hope I didn't irritate at you in any way, or is it just a class assignment? Okay. Uh, he's going to see if he's within a 10-minute walk of a park in Chicago. Uh, you guys at Harvard are special. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, have a budget that's three years in a row balanced. Three years in a row doesn't raise property taxes, sales tax, or gas tax. And three years in a row increases investment in children's whether it's after school programs, pre-K, or any one of those areas. Now, before I conclude, two years running, more companies have moved into the city of Chicago than in prior years, and more people after a decade of lost population have moved into the city of Chicago. We have the fastest growing downtown of any city in America, and the battles that we've had on education, I think, are to the direct benefit of what we're doing. One thing I want to say on education, besides we kind of view it from pre-K to college. Our goal for education is we're going to be 100% college ready and 100% college bound. We have the highest graduation rate in the history of the city. We have more schools now rated level one than ever before. More schools moved into level one than ever before. And our math and science and, and reading test scores have gone up three years in a row. But the most important thing I've done on education, besides, not the most, but in addition, in the city of Chicago, the mayor also controls the city colleges. Now, you all are special. And I mean that, not sarcastically, not joking. You're going to Harvard. In the city of Chicago, I have seven community colleges. 127,000 kids and adults go to those schools. More kids go to our community colleges than all four-year institutions combined. So if you put DePaul, the largest Catholic university in the world, University of Chicago, Northwestern, Northeastern, Loyola, all the universities, Columbia, Roosevelt, all of them together, more go to community colleges, and the four-year institutions. In the past, the f- community colleges used to be considered a place where people finally got their last bit of their fifth year of high school education. So we did a, mo- we did a study with McKinsey and Brookings on our growth pattern, where we want to be 10 years from now. I ordered it. We get it. There are six fields that will be the biggest job growth. Healthcare, transportation, distribution, logistics, ch- uh, culinary, hospitality, IT, advanced manufacturing, professional services. Each school has a specialty. Industry develops the curriculum in that field. They stand as an advisory. They train the teachers towards it. The teachers get a pay for performance based on kids that are studied in that field. If they get a job in that area, go. And the reason is, I want to tell you something as a former congressman that used to represent Wright Community College. When you go somewhere and you say, I went to Harvard, it has economic value. When I go somewhere and I say, I went to Sarah Lawrence or Northwestern, it has economic value. I couldn't, in good conscience, look at those 127,000 young adults some continuing ed, and said if they went to a hospital and said I went to Malcolm X, it had the same economic value. And they're doing everything right. They're holding down jobs, and they're going to school. And I believe that if somebody's from Malcolm X and it goes to Rush Presbyterian and wants to get a job as a nurse, it should have economic value. If you want to be 
a legal aid, and you're going to Harold Washington, it should have economic value. So we revamped the community colleges because I also want to say not just to the people going there, and it, it, just so you know, the World Bank just did a report that the community college system in the city of Chicago, the College of Career, is the best skill development educational program in the country. And we're only at this in two years from a system that used to have a graduation rate of 7%. It grew by 80% in the last two years. And I want to say to any company that moves to Chicago, you want somebody out of Booth School Business School? We got it. You want somebody at the University of Illinois Computer School and Accounting School, best in the country? We got it. You want somebody out of our law schools? You got it. You want somebody to do IT in your office? We got it. You want somebody to be a nurse in your hospital? We got it. And if we can give every company absolute certainty in the employee spectrum, from business school to community college, everybody will beat their doors down to the city of Chicago. And it guarantees when I say that 35% of our population has a four-year degree or better, we will continue to out-educate any other city. The single most important thing to do as a mayor today in a city is the education policies you put in place. And that's why I wanted to be mayor at a time where I think you can actually get something done and move the needle forward. So I look forward to taking your questions. I hope none of you follow the path of this young man and walk out. <laughs> Uh, but I hope, I look forward to the discussion we're going to have on what's going on in cities, but particularly in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Well, let's start where you started. You said the nation state is broken. So you went from being what some people would see as the second most powerful man in the country, some would say the free world, to the mayor of a Midwestern city. What theory did you have of running a city that was, that's been turned on its ear since you've been running Chicago? So what did you go in with a preconceived idea of what it would be like that... No, well, first of all, uh, Lois, I mean, I had certain ideas, but, you know, I, let me say, let me do this by analogy. I used to say when I worked for President Clinton, if we knew on the first year of the second term what we knew by the first year of the first, well, if we knew in the first year of the first term what we knew by the first year of the second term, we'd all be geniuses. So when everybody says, oh, the, what does a president need? They need the ability to learn. They gotta have judgment. They gotta have the capacity to learn. I had certain views of what I thought a big city mayor would do, but if I told you I knew it before I got there, that'd be, I'd be lying to you. I had certain philosophical goals about education, the importance of early childhood education. Prior to me being mayor, city of Chicago, half our kids got a two hour kindergarten day. They got a half day, 20,000 kids. It wasn't an education, it was babysitting. So this year, based on reforms and cuts I've made in the central office, every child gets a universal full seven and a half hour kindergarten day. I fundamentally believe in early childhood. 5,000 children are getting an additional pre-K years, seven and a half with wraparound services for their parents. That I believed in. Now, how did you get there? I'm willing to eliminate overtime for operating engineers to the tune of $12 million and use it to put into kindergarten. Uh, there was no manual. There's no manual in the, in the desk that says, pulls that out and says, here's what you do. I believed in education, believed in infrastructure. I just kind of walked you through that because I also knew to move an economy efficiently and effectively. How we're going to pay for it, how we're going to do certain things, that's different than what you have. I always say this, let me say the wrap up on this is, I can't, this is the greatest job I had. I can't imagine doing this job not having been senior advisor, chief of staff, and congressman. On the other hand, I think I would have been a better chief of staff to President Obama had I been mayor first. Glad I did it the way I did it, but that perspective of being mayor would have made you a smarter chief of staff. Um, let's talk about education a little bit, because clearly you're very proud of what you're doing in the city. Um, and it sounds like you're doing quite a bit. Um, but when I go back and read the clips, it seems like your new first name is embattled. Um, the teachers union says they're going to make you a one-term mayor. They're mad because you closed 50 schools. African-American community says that those schools affected them. How do you reconcile these two things? Well, I don't want to be data-driven, but let's go through this. When I ran for mayor, we had a 53% graduation rate. That meant we had a, basically a dropout for every graduate. Today we're at 65%, and if you look freshman on track, we're going to get to 80%. 
no disrespect to your profession, the free press, mm -hmm. but you probably haven't read that since you looked at the clips. That's true. Number two, okay. I used to tell President Clinton, and this will get me in trouble, when he would rant and rave about sometimes Lois's writing or others, I would say, when it comes to the American press, the First Amendment's highly overrated. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, see, I told you, they really love that when they get on there. Uh, second, we have more level one schools than ever before. This year, the 170 plus, this level one being the top, this year 53 schools, moved, 53 actual schools moved into level one. Two years running, our math and reading scores have gone up. More kids than we got, we started a decade ago with about 10 million in scholarship won by students. This year we went north of 400 million in scholarships. So the data says one thing. Now, I gotta be honest. When you say, okay, battle. I have a majority of kids in the city of Chicago, majority, are at poverty or below. Now, if you were trying to end poverty, would your answer be, let's give them the shortest school day and the shortest school year in the country? Now, I don't think, now, it was a battle. Okay, we had a seven day, 10 day strike. It was a decade long fight to get that. You can call it a battle. I happen to call it uh, bringing some justice to the world. Now we did have a uh, disagreement, Lois. My, the mayor before me tried to do the same thing I tried to do. Two different people on the other side said, no, we're done. Nobody's even talking about going back. We had to go through that, but we now have given the children of the city of Chicago a full school day and a full school year for the first time. We've given every child going to kindergarten a full day. We were the last big city without a full day of kindergarten. And you say it's battled. I mean, I don't think we should have a decade for a simple, well, let me say this. If the, if the shortest day was such a great thing, I don't see anybody flying around here wanting to do it. Do you see anybody from Shanghai, Shanghai coming to Chicago and say, hey, let's get this model and bring it home? So you say, oh, it's a battle. Now, nobody likes to close schools. I don't like closing schools. We started with 300 schools were under-enrolled. So I took all the high schools off the list. I took every school that was level one off the list. I took the notion that kids would have to go, they had to go from one school to a better school and it had to be a mile left. 300 came down to 50. Now had we, over the decade, not postponed and not delayed this decision, you would have done it in a more five every year over a period of time where you didn't rip your guts out. I did the 50 and I put a moratorium in place for not doing this for the number five years. But if you look at the time, look at the results, yes, the political system may be embattled, but the kids are better off. Did it disproportionately impact African-American and Latino kids? We, no. It, it disproportionately affected uh, African-American. In the city of Chicago, we just did a report. I told you I just, move kids from 50 schools that were under-enrolled. Some of them, you know there was a high school with 50 kids. You can't field a football team with 50 kids. It's not a high school. There were schools that were two, a third occupied. But we also now have 50 schools, the survey showed, that are uh, overpopulated. I have a school, another part of the town, Wildwood, built for 240 and 420 kids go there. So we have a lot of overcrowding as much as under-enrolled. In the last decade, city of Chicago, which is why I'm proud the last two years more people have moved in than moved out, we lost 200,000 people, of which 189,000 were in the African-American community. You wanna keep people in the city? You gotta give them good schools. Now, nobody likes doing it. It should have been done over the decade rather than one. Uh, but there was under-enrolled. Now what did I do? I took for the first time, we fixed 60 schools, which is 10% of the student buildings. We put 25, it's a little over 2,000 air conditioned in buildings that were 100 years or older. Every kid got, a, we had iPads, 1,500 wireless capacity, new windows, new tuck pointing, new paint, new lighting, things where everybody says, oh, kids are learning in 100 year old buildings where the paint's falling down, the windows are falling. We put $250 million into capital into those schools that had I kept the old schools open, you never had the resources to do this. And I put it to where the schools were. And in addition, knowing full well the kids would not all go to those welcoming schools, 
we started to switch to student-based budgeting so the dollars would follow wherever the kids went. This was tough, but something that should have been done in years past, and we finally did. From where you sit now, um, if you had one request of Congress to pass something that would solve a crucial problem of yours, what would it be? Only one? <laughs> Let me give you three things that I think. Uh, <laughs> Let me give you eight things. <laughs> well, I'll give you, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm about to do my budget, so you gotta understand, yeah. I mean, I think anybody run for office, I'm, that's where my mind is. I'm proud of the fact I've increased our total dollars for after school by 10%, even while I'm balancing three budgets, okay? And my last budget last year was $100 million smaller than Rich Daly's final budget. Smaller, and yet our funding for after school went up. I, it went up in total dollars, even when the federal and state support for after schools cut by 25%. So my total dollars went up, even when the feds were cutting down. Summer jobs, we put 20,000 kids into summer jobs. More than ever before in the history of the city. Even when the feds and state cut back. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but they cut back, so our no overall number was higher. Outside of Clinton doing children's health care and outside of Lyndon Johnson doing Head Start, you can't tell me a single thing the federal government's done for kids in the last 50 years. And we're showing for it as a country. The federal government has walked away from children. It's done a horrible job. And the only thing I'd ask them is give me the money, let's raise the standards, and let's give it towards kids. Because outside of Head Start and kid care, you can't tell me a single thing the federal government's done for children. Nothing. And those would be the places I would ask because you need kids with, given where we have a lot of parents that aren't home at three o'clock, given what goes on for summer employment, which is necessary for kids, uh, I would ask for help in both summer jobs after school, but I got early childhood education, I got infrastructure, I'd like them to help, but I'm under no illusions, which is why I say states, cities now have to do it on their own because the federal government and the state government has walked away from what their responsibilities are. Do you have a better appreciation for that now that you're on the other side about how little the government is doing in the budget cuts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've always believed in what I believed in, but I, uh, uh, but you know, it's also not just money. Let me give you an example. And actually, this is something I supported uh, George Bush, but we never got that. I'm not for, you know, Head Start. Great program. I fought every year as a congressman, every year as senior advisor, more money, more money. I'd be interested in a, a, an agreement. We won't ask for more money, we're not gonna cut it, but here's what we're gonna do to review the educational standards of Head Start. Because we just did, I'll give you an example, pre-K. I put 5,000 kids into pre-K, full day wraparound service with parents. We ran our own state, citywide race to the top based on dollars to either Chicago Public Schools, uh, Head Start, Charters, which allowed to compete for the first time, and faith-based. And uh, obviously, uh, whoever was the best won. And, but I would like some academic rigor around early childhood. Academic rigor also for their parents, because if you're doing uh, poverty or below, you need that. And you make sure that then there's extra money for it. But I want the academic rigor with the resources. Um, let's move on to crime. Um, we read a lot about Chicago and crime. Um, high murder rate surpasses New York City as the murder capital. Tell me, tell us what you're doing about yeah. that. Well, first of all, our overall crime is down two years, 24%. Shootings this year are down 23%, and homicides, any, I mean, remember, this moves, but those are, so homicides are down about 20%. Part of that change, now 2011 looks, that's kind of analytical of it, data, there it is. Chicago has historically had a higher murder rate. The bigger problem than New York, that's just true. The bigger problem is we, ha we take more guns off the street of the city of Chicago than either New York or LA any week. New York happens to have Connecticut and New Jersey with their gun laws next to it. We're at the crossroads of the country, and we happen to have Wisconsin and Indiana on either side of us. We're the transportation distribution logistics center of the country, which is why there's a lot of guns that come through the city. We have, so we also have a gang culture. Now, the reason we've seen gangs this year 
is we did a look at 2010, 11, and 12. Where was the worst homicide, shooting, and robberies? Then we ran 2012 against three years' worth of data. We took, think of it as 20 areas, 20 blocks each, just to kind of, some are 18, some are 35, so just think of it as that at 10,000 feet. We put foot patrol in those areas. Where I just gave you the overall city number, it's double the reduction. So where hom shootings are down 24%, they're down 45% there. Where their homicides are down 20%, they're down 40% there. Overall crime is down close to about 50% or 45% in those areas. We've saturated them. It's 3% of the geography of the city that was creating 20 to 24% of all the problems. We have 22 police districts of which almost 85% of the problem and the challenge, which is really more than crime, it's about poverty, is in eight of that 22 districts. That's where the bulk of it is. So yeah. you had, there was 500 and some murders last year. You're at 340 now, and two months ago, you think you're gonna come in under? I'm not, I don't reduce make, it? I'm <laughs> I, I don't, no, that, that's not prediction. I, you know, you always got, that's a prediction business. I don't mm -hmm. do, I'll hire somebody to do predictive and anal analytics. I don't do that. We are at 340. It's two months or some, and two and a half weeks, two, two and a half months to go. I know what we have to do. There are other things we gotta do. I'm pushing right now for a three year min minimum for gun felonies like New York. We have a one year minimum in Chicago. If you shoplift, we have a one year minimum. If you sell a cigarette illegally, it's a one year minimum. Now personally, I happen to think if you do a gun felony, it's more serious. That's me, maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think our gun laws on the books act as the deterrent they need to be. And I'm not about locking up, just so everyone understands. In the city council last year, I am for locking up the right people. But last year, I reduced, so we took 1,200 people that used to arrest and put in jail for marijuana. You have 15 ounces or less, the cop has discretion on tickets. We're issuing tickets. So I'm not into putting somebody for a minor possession of marijuana into jail. I am for, you commit a gun felony, you should go to jail, you should do the time for the crime you committed. And if you do that, you'll have an effective deterrent. And I'm meeting with the federal government, uh, our new U.S. attorney, because the U.S. attorney in Chicago has not been active in this effort of uh, prosecuting gun crimes. We have a lot of work to do, but we're making a lot of progress. But my big challenge is to make sure every part of the city feels the same safety as other parts of the city enjoy. I think we're gonna to go to questions in a minute, but I have one um, final question, and that is, are you gonna support Hillary Clinton in 2016? <laughs> Lois, I, you probably know it is premature to support <laughs> anybody since nobody announced. I'm gonna support between now and 2016 President Obama, make sure he's an effective and, and great president. It, it, you know, I have to note here that um, Rom, who had worked for the Clintons, but was from Illinois, did the most incredible job not endorsing either President Obama or Hillary Clinton during the primary I said season. I, was, I said I was gonna hide under my desk with my blankie and I'm not getting out <laughs> until the primary is over. So are, do I have time for one more question or are we gonna take questions now? Okay, so um, you were on the ground floor of Obamacare and you were one of the primary authors. I know 2020 hindsight, but if you I wouldn't were, say author, I right. would say <laughs> responsible for getting it passed. In looking back um, and now seeing the pushback, is there anything you would do a little bit differently to make it more salable? And can you tell us that? And I say that, I mean, Kate's here, who I uh, worked with, was my assistant when I was DCCC and was the president's assistant uh, is here. To the, and I say that because to the president's great credit, he knew my reluctance about doing this having lived through the Clinton years. And I was up front with him, and every time it was either a challenge, he would ask me, "Are you still? would you still suggest that I do this? <laughs> Even though he knew, I wanted to do health care, but not what we did, and, I, and to his credit, he had the strength to always ask for an alternative view. He didn't want to surround himself with a yes person. I had my view from a sense of both a policy, but more political than policy. Um, look, I, let me say this, not about the marketing. I think the health care bill is gonna be tremendously successful in reducing health care costs. It already has, and it will be over the next 10 years. And we are in the beginning stages. I can tell you as a mayor, I couldn't balance the three budgets I balanced if it wasn't for the fact that our health care costs were coming down. 
from what was expected at growth. The third biggest item in the city of Chicago was health care costs. They were growing at 10% a year, and tax revenue wasn't growing at 10% a year. It was unsustainable. So it's come down. So the bill will be unbelievably successful at the very thing Republicans said was the number one priority, controlling costs. It'll be incredibly successful. I guarantee you, Harvard is seeing the same gains that I'm seeing. Everybody is. Number two, the coverage, in my view, will be challenging because states that aren't doing the exchanges, it's one thing not to do the exchange. It's also there, it's one, another thing if you're openly hostile to the enrollment and trying to undermine it. And the interesting thing is, based on the plan that looks a lot like Massachusetts plan under a former governor, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where you have 99% coverage with some control of healthcare costs, I don't think it will achieve everything it's supposed to achieve on co expanding coverage but will be incredibly successful on achieving with the cost containment elements of it. And that is a way of avoiding answering your question about marketing. <laughs> well, people still don't know what's in it. I mean, could the administration have done a better job um, just, messaging you know, it? You know, Lois, I mean, if you sit here in retrospect, look, you could say they could have done it, but uh, you could look at this and look at that. There is something to be learned from the past about going forward about how to do this. Don't underestimate the fact that you had a full throttle campaign effort coming at it to undermine it. That will continue. It won't end. Um, all right. I think we're going to go to your questions now. So um, we have microphones around the room if you all want to step up to the microphones. Maybe you covered everything. Um, okay. So here, here are our rules. All questioners must identify themselves. <laughs> um, and your family name. Right. Um, Zip no, codes. No speeches, please. And there should be a question mark at the end of whatever you're going to say. <laughs> All right, we'll start this way. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Luke Gilroy. I'm an MPP here at the HKS. What is MPP? Mass for Public Policy. Okay. Um, thanks very much for coming to speak. Uh, my question is about the Chicago long term financial issues around pensions, everything you mentioned. Sounds fantastic. Seems like everything's headed in the right direction. I, okay. um, but basically, is there a, a problem with being able to do all those issues long term with the uh, coming pension problem? Yes. <laughs> Could you yeah. elaborate a little bit? Please? <laughs> no. Uh, but a very insightful question. No, here's, here, Luke, here's the deal. Look, and this is part of, I ran on dealing with pensions. My, uh, to, you know, I remember about 25 to 30% of the city of Chicago households are union. And I said we have to fix this problem. So I did it at great political cost. I then about 17 months ago went down to uh, our state capital and laid out a very specific plan. Uh, third is uh, I've dealt with retiree health care that is longer discussion. It's called the Shackman class. It was court ordered, not part of a, uh, negotiations on a contract that dealt with $100 million of retiree health care, providing everybody health care, but in a different way, saving us money. And do not, I think everybody should know this, do not underestimate health care costs. This is an equally important exploding cost, which we have dealt with in the city of Chicago and continually deal with. Lastly, I negotiated a deal with the sergeants. It was voted down eight to one. Now, here's the truth, I would say. Not that what I said wasn't the truth, but let me say this going <laughs> forward. Is you got to understand everybody that's an employee that has a pension. First of all, in 1983, they got taken out of Medi uh, Social Security. So this is their retirement. Second is, after every contract, they agreed they have paid in every monthly pay stub into that pension. The cities and states haven't kept up. Sometimes they get on holidays or they pay a portion. Now, the other thing is we all agreed to things that we knew that none of the payments would be equal to what the benefits were being promised. Nobody's gotten an 8% return on their equity investment in the last decade. But nobody wanted to tell anybody the truth. So now it's come. 
Now, my big thing is if we don't fix that, everything I'm going to do is just you said it's going to be endangered. That's what I say. It has to have a balanced approach between revenue and reform. And you can't do it on this side, and you can't cut your way out of it. And you're going to either, we're going to agree to it as mature adults, or it's going to come to a head in a crisis, and then it's going to be done to us. I'd rather try the other road. But you are right. And it's not, and Chicago's not alone, although our problem is severe, severe, more severe than others because of, and the other thing I would say is time. You got 40 years getting into this, it's not gonna take you four years to get out of this. And anybody tries to do it like that, you're gonna break the back of the system. So that would be the way I look at it, but you are right. And I think it endangers everything, uh, and I can't say it because we're on camera, but I'm gonna have a part of my speech in the budget that's about how to protect things that I think are important so pension payments don't endanger that. Thanks very much. Okay. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tacoa De Silva, thank you for taking my question. Uh, and that is <laughs> we'll see if I take it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Tacoa. Um, and that is about the, uh, the fiscal state of the U.S. Uh, some <laughs> people point out in the financial community that it's the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Um, and you also pointed out a few years ago that uh, to never let a good crisis go to waste when there's an opportunity to do something about it. And so I'd like to ask your thoughts, if a financial crisis were to occur of some kind because of that debt, how would you solve that? Would you, some people say, print your way out of it or- uh, Run to Harvard and get a, a master's. Right. <laughs> uh, Sorry? No. So what I said was, never allow a good crisis to go to waste. It's the opportunity to do the big things you never thought you could do before. That's what a crisis provides. Everything that you thought was off the table because you couldn't do it, once you have a crisis, well, it gets into the, the front and center is no longer on the periphery. Look, um, I don't, I can't kind of do a hypothetical what I would do if we all of a sudden were such a debtor country that here's what the crisis looks like. I just can't do that for you. I can talk you through what we did when we faced the worst eco economy, the worst a financial meltdown, and an auto industry that was about to go belly up. Those were real crises. As to the nation's debt, um, unfortunately, our political system is set up only to uh, deal in big ways with big crises when they're right in front of you. As I like to remind you in 19, if I can, in 1983, when we quote unquote fixed Social Security, it was three months away from not being able to make payments. Not 30 years, not 30 months, three months. Unfortunately, that's how we're set up. I can say, uh, when you look at each of the crises President Obama handled, and any one of them were, were equal to a full term on their own, standalone, he handled them in a methodical way, and I, the most glaring example of that, in my view, is at least look at the auto industry. We now are producing cars at 16 million in a profitable capacity. More people are now working in the industry than before, and we have higher auto efficiency standards than ever before, because he finally forced the industry and labor and suppliers and the financial industry to do what they, none of them would do over 30 years. It took a crisis or a near fatality to get them around the table to actually do what was in their own self-interest that they refused to do over the last 30 years. Thank Thanks. you. Oh, oh. oh I'm, I apologize. I didn't, I'm sorry. Hi there. My name is Jasmine Omeki, and I'm a senior in Kirkland House. Okay. Um, I'm also a Chicagoan, a Whitney Young Dolphin. Um, yeah. <laughs> you got a great principal. Yeah. It's, it's great to have you here, not just to see you on WGN News. <laughs> Um, I know there was a compliment in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. So my question is, um, as we've seen with the government shutdown and other gridlocks in Congress, what I'm wondering, um, at least in my point of view, cities are becoming the beacons of innovation. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what can cities do uh, within their bureaucratic processes to ease the creative sector uh, in regards to them being able to carry out their own initiatives? Um, and I'm explicitly referring to the Chicago Cultural Plan of 2012. I just love this woman, first of all. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. No, there's two things, if I think I understand, the, what we could do that could help the not-for-profit not and or the entrepreneurial community, is that what? Yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, first of all, uh, when I got into office, we did, um, it, there hadn't been a new cultural plan for the city of Chicago since Harold Washington uh, was mayor. So I don't know if you know Michelle Boone. So I made her, uh, she came out of a, a couple of the Joyce Foundation. I made her the cultural 
uh, commissioner, czar, whatever word you want to use. So she ran a citywide process, like 100 plus meetings across the city, and gave us a plan. Two things, big, biggest piece of it is people wanted um, uh, the arts and cultures back in their own kind of community. Now we have a, I'm biased as you can imagine, Art Institute was just rated number one museum in America, number three in the world. We have the same amount of Tony Award winning theater companies as all of New York, the city of Chicago. As a dancer, we have the largest free dance uh, uh, seven, week, seven day um, festival in the city of Chicago, largest one in the country. Great downtown Millennium Park, you know, great cultural institutions, uh, and I'm bullish about it. And it's great because it helps me recruit companies, people to move the city. People wanted things in their uh, neighborhood. So this summer, two summers ago, I did this theater in the parks, or not, we call it night out in the parks. And we're a city of parks, and as you know, uh, and that meant Shakespeare did nine performances around the city free. Everything was like, we thought if 500 people show up, 1,200 came. We thought 1,000 would show up, 2,000 showed up. Uh, we did circuits in the park, we did Joffrey, we did Chicago Symphony. Anybody that got public money that was a downtown institute, I said you had to be out in the neighborhood. It was so successful, so this last year we did 750 in our parks. I'm gonna do more in my up upcoming budget. So people, it's all free, and it's all major theater companies, dance company, music, everything in our neighborhood parks free. So in your own park, in your own neighborhood, take your lawn chair and you can go see Shakespeare, Red Moon Theater, Joffrey, Chicago Symphony, and we have it throughout the city. It was a spectacular success with over 200,000 people coming. The other thing we're doing is, I haven't talked about it, but the longer school day allows, every school has an arts administrator. No longer do the children of the city of Chicago have to have a choice made between math or music. They're gonna get both, just like you. They're gonna get re reading and recess, just like you got. They're gonna get arithmetic and the arts, just like you got. So the kids of the city of Chicago won't be cheated and arts are back in our school. And I say that as a former dancer. It's essential for kids' education. The other piece is we're creating spaces where uh, people can both work and live in the same kind of loft type uh, structure. I thought originally you were talking about kind of the uh, entrepreneurial piece, but that's what we're doing kind of in the, uh, the cultural plan and bringing the arts back in the community. And I just gave, we held NATO as you know, we had some extra resources, so I gave the Beverly community $250,000, they restructured their debt and their arts and cultural center in Beverly will be uh, kept open. And I wanna say one thing, I live in the Ravenswood neighborhood. We have the Old Town School of Folk Music. It opened up 10 years ago in an area on Lincoln Avenue. It used to be a gangbanger area. There's now, you can't find parking there now based on restaurants and bars and everything off of it. One of the great economic engines a city can have is not what it has just downtown, but in its own neighborhoods, culture, arts, entertainment is one of the most important economic engines you can have for a commercial area and for the stability of a residential community. So it's uh, one of the things that we're implementing and that's what we're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, four mics, wow. Oh, hi, um, my name is Jonas Altsman. Um, I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, so I'm not sure if you've seen the tax foundation numbers, but um, there's sort of a trend in this, you know, throughout the country where the more heavily urbanized states tends to pay more uh, in federal taxes than they get back in benefits, and it's the reverse for yep. for rural states. So I'm wondering if you see that as sort of a long-term, you know, not threat, but a, a problem for these urban states, and what you think, uh, you know, we could potentially do about it. Um, that we pay more in taxes than we well, get back? Well, yeah, the fact that cities are sort of subsidizing this rural uh, lifestyle in America. Well, look, the way I, I think you've heard my perspective on this, I'm not eager to tax people. In fact, I eliminated the tax in the city of Chicago two years ahead of schedule. I think we have a dumb debate in this country. So if I can take your question slightly different. This, this is really, it's, taxes are not an economic policy. Now businesses need certainty about taxes as do families. But if I gave you a zero corporate tax rate in the state of Illinois, but I took O'Hare out, do you think anybody would move a company there? It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Or how about this, I'll give you a zero corporate rate, but you get no graduates out of either Booth School or Kellogg School. 
you think any company would come to the city of Chicago? So it's not about how high or how low, it's about what certainty, number one. And number two, those in the business community who constantly write, we need low taxes, low taxes. You have to think, now we who believe that government can be an affirmative force have to be more upfront about where we fall short, but what are our essential investments? As you could probably tell from what I said, I'm whole hog into infrastructure. And I'm whole hog into education. Those are the two most productive things you can invest in. I don't think how much or how little taxes we pay is really a debate. I think we gotta give people certainty both on the tax side and the investment side. And if you do that, you're gonna get great economics out of it rather than what we do in a city versus what we do rural. So I, know I probably took your question not where you wanted to go, but that's, okay. that's the liberty of me standing here and you're about 30 feet away. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jacob Cohen and I'm also a student at the Kennedy School. David? David? Jacob. Cohen. Oh, Jacob, I apologize. No I was just going Old Testament on you for a second. <laughs> Un understandable. Um, I'm wondering if, if your experience uh, as mayor of Chicago has given you any insights around this question of um, the ideal governance structure for large school systems and uh, across the country, uh, if we're really looking at um, trying to improve results and opportunities for students, you know, what should be the respective role of the mayor versus a centralized school board versus sort of site level governance mechanisms be? You know, uh I just gave, gave us the keynote to Jeb Bush's foundation today, and I talked about school principals. First of all, uh, and I said that because too much of the discussion about education, performance, and academic results is focused on teachers as if they're the sole bearer of that responsibility. Who runs that building? Who creates a culture in that building? Who creates an environment to invite parents into feeling like that school welcomes them rather than pushes them away? Who sets the goals? Who creates a culture of accountability? The school principal. Hold them. Look, education, there's, this is the three things. Regardless of where you're from, regardless of what your uh, background is, regardless of what your income is. An involved parent, a motivating teacher, and a, a pro an accountable principal. You put those three things together, I don't care where a kid comes from, they're gonna succeed. And if you don't have those three things, I don't care where a kid comes from, they're not gonna succeed. Now, I happen to believe, rather than I, the city of Chicago, the mayor has the authority, points the board and the chancellor. LA, they have none of that. The mayor doesn't do any of that. Now, I happen to think, and I'll just say this, I can't be, imagine being mayor responsible for the health and welfare of a city and not have the uh, ability to be accountable for education. I think the mayor's accountable, the chancellor's accountable, the pastors are accountable, the parents are accountable, the principal's accountable, the teacher's accountable. If you're an adult, you're accountable for children. That's the way I look at it. Now, I happen to think in this whole thing, I made a discussion point, we have the most rigorous process for retention, training, and recruitment of our principals, and a whole systematic reform of that. Principals are the key people that run that building. And they need to be part of our evaluation and our culture of accountability if you wanna move the academics of a student. It is not the sole responsibility of the teacher. It's addition, the most important door a child walks through for their education, the front door of their home. It is there, like every one of you, where you learn the value of an education. At school, you got an education. At home, you learn the importance of it. And none of you would be sitting in this chair if you didn't have parents or parents that were involved. That and what you set up in the school is how do you get parents who feel welcome inside that school to be part of their own child's education, who maybe themselves don't have the complete education. How do you answer that? That's part of our evaluation of how we see principals do their job in the city of Chicago. Hi, Mr. Mayor, uh, my name is David Clifton. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, my question is much less specific than other people's, but uh, still hopefully interesting nonetheless. Um, <laughs> as White House Chief of Staff, what is something that you wish the White House could have done or could have done better than they did? Um, as White House Chief of Staff, um, there are things that I, I would say that, whether it's me or the President, that were off the that we didn't get done that we would wa want to have gotten done. Um, some stuff on energy policy that 
you know, you guys, we're all living in a period of time that the United States now is a net exporter, not creating a national standards around uh, natural gas drilling and fracking. You're going to live in a period of time I didn't live in when I grew up. And it's a big, one of the biggest game changers in my view, as big as internet. And not getting that done uh, would be, uh, in my view, one of the things that setting some goals and national standards and letting that industry really flourish for a whole host of reasons. Uh, I don't know how much time I got here that I could go into. That, uh, well, the biggest factor in the economy for the United States, the biggest factor in our politics in the last 30 years was the loss of the purchasing power of uh, non-college educated white men. Energy is gonna give non-college white men a huge boom in their bump in their economic purchasing power. It's gonna change the economic and therefore the political landscape of the United States. It's gonna allow the United States to re-import manufacturing here at home. You think about the economic impact of that, the fact that we're not dependent on the Middle East anymore for oil, at every level it's a fundamental game changer. And we, things are happening by themselves without the you know, president or the Congress getting that done that I think had we done it, we could even be farther down the road in areas. The other thing that I would say is infrastructure, but I'm telling you what I haven't gotten done. To running the White House, I would say, um, I think it was impeccably well run, so I could I not reform that. <laughs> okay, where do I go now, up there? Okay. Hi, my name is Lindsay and I'm a freshman at the college. And if I heard you correctly, you said that one of your goals for Chicago is in education is for students to be 100% college ready. And I'm curious, do you see a role for vocational education in high school so that if a student is not college ready for whatever reason, he or she is at least career ready? I, no, I, I thought I said if I didn't, thank you for correcting it. I thought I said 100% college ready and 100 either college bound or career ready. So okay. I apologize for that and thank you for the correction because that's an important uh, point. Um, and uh, two things, one of the, I, I actually believe the changes I'm making at our community colleges is part of that process. Um, because for too long, I mean, just to give you an example, in the city of Chicago, we had a 7% graduation rate from our community colleges. Now, it's at 12 and on its way north there. Second is, people were really getting their last education, a fifth year of high school, rather than getting ready for a job. And that's what the transformation we're trying to make for that. I do want to set the goal that we're 100% college ready, 100% college bound, because while I'm proud that we're making progress on graduation, the truth is a high school graduation and a high school diploma is the equality of basically equal today to being unemployed. And if you don't have two years post, and I don't care whether it's a journeyman at a plumbing, Electrical, carpenter, military, or college, four-year institution, or two years of community college, you're not going to be employable. So while I'm proud of our ever-growing high school rate, I'm more proud of the fact that more kids are college-bound and college-ready. And that's what I'm trying to set the goal as. Three-quarters of all jobs starting from this point forward for the next, as far as the eye can see, require a minimum of two years post-high school education, wherever you get that. One of the changes we made, I will tell you, at our community colleges, if you want to be a nurse and you happen to be a veteran and you worked in Iraq or back uh, Afghanistan as a nurse, you get credit for that education. If you want to work and go to a school in transportation, distribution, logistics, and you worked in the supply part of the military, you get credit when you apply to community colleges and you don't have to repeat those classes. So that's part of what, we, what we're trying to do educationally for career ready, not just college ready. And I, I really do mean, I appreciate the correction because I thought I said it, and I, if I didn't, I didn't say it the way we review it. My name is John Axton. I'm a freshman at the college. And you said that you learned a lot during your time as mayor, which presumably means that there are decisions you made as mayor that had you learned more at that point, you would have done differently. So I'm just wondering what have you done as mayor that you wish you could have gone back and done differently? If I told you, Jonathan, I'd have to kill you. No, <laughs> uh, um, there's a lot of things on a, uh, things that I've approached that uh, you know about how I would go forward on something, um, where I would go on any one of the subjects that I've worked on uh, on our budget. So. I'd have to get back to you on the, you know, this specific thing, that specific thing. 
Um, as you can probably tell, politics is pretty contentious in Chicago, and anything I would say at Harvard doesn't stay at Harvard. So uh, uh, I approach at that. Yeah, you can laugh. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll take. I owe you a more complete answer than the one I'm giving you, but I'm always. Well, I always am uh, learning different things that we could have done different to explain what our goals are. Okay. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Please. You want to pick how that goes? Okay. Go okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, my name's Meg. It's Meg? Uh, yeah, Meg, I'm from the UK. But mm -hmm. I run a program in Chicago. It's an innovative, groundbreaking program, and I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to tell you a bit about it. But basically, we take students from the University of Chicago, and we run debating programs on the south side of Chicago. It is a game changer. We do get the kids' work and career ready, and college ready. But every week, if my students go into the schools, I have to make a decision about whether it's safe enough for them to be mm -hmm. there. Am I right to make that decision and say, yes, go in, kids? Oh, Chicago schools are very safe. It's what we got to do around the schools and keeping them safe. But the schools, very safe. Cool. Can I come and talk to you about this program? No. It's yeah, but I would, I would yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Beth Swanson is the person I want you to call. And my, uh, Beth, Elizabeth, Beth Swanson. Swanson. Yeah, right. before we leave, I'll get you the number. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to go here, just to be fair. I'm a former Englewood charter school teacher and current... Which one? Um, Perspectives Leadership yeah. Academy. Mm -hmm. um, and a current Master's of Education Policy student. You talked a little bit about how you had to close 50 public schools because they were being underutilized. But it was also recently posted that there is proposal for a massive charter school expansion in the city of Chicago. And I'm kind of wondering if that indicates a lack of faith in public schools that were expanding charters and closing public schools. You no, know, the other thing is I, I'm the first mayor to close two charter schools for underperformance. Let me say this, I'm not a, as what I just told Bush's group, I'm not an education reformer. I believe in educational excellence, and I'll adopt any reform that gets me there. And I'm the first mayor to close charter schools, and I do support that choice. I don't tell parents they have to send their kid, but I want them to have that choice. In the same way, we're the only school system in the country that has every military branch runs a high school, and 90% of the kids at the military go to college. We're expanding our IB. That's choice. We're expanding five new STEM high schools that go from ninth grade to 14th grade. That's choice. I am making other charters available, but I'm also closing those that don't perform academically. We did have to close those schools who were under-enrolled, and that's the case, but I'm also committed. Some of the best high schools in the city are noble high, charter high schools, and they do a phenomenal job, and everywhere they are, there are more people trying to get in them than we have seats available. That's a choice. It's not a bad, I don't actually buy the, the narrow sense of choice, as you just, not that you described it that way, but it's charter versus public school. We have more choices in the city of Chicago. Military, neighborhood, selective enrollment, IB, STEM, and, any, and charter. And my view is you should have all that available so you can make the choice of what's best for your child. That's what a comprehensive, full body choice decision is. It's not limited to charter versus neighborhood. In the schools we dealt with, which was painful, it was where there was under enrollment and under academic achievement. I don't think keeping a building open that is not succeeding academically is good for kids. Giving them the opportunity to go to a school that has proven record is right, and the parents will choose whether they want to check that school or something else. That's their choice. Yeah, thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks, that was great. Huh? Thank, you. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you all for coming.